one. Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's Security Boulevard webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, the moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great event on tap. I'm, I'm really excited about this one. It's a live hack. But before we get started, uh, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded. So if you missed, miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And uh, we are taking questions from the audience. So if you have any uh, question for our speakers today, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use that question and answer tab there on the in interface and submit your question. And we'll try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. We are also, uh, we also have a very interactive chat feature. So I encourage you to chat us your questions, comments, suggestions, whatever you wanna share with us. We'll be more than happy to chat you back and maybe even get you involved in the presentation. And then finally, at the end of today's webinar, we are going to be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our four lucky winners. All right, with that, let's go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is Kubernetes Lifecycle Security Red Hat OpenShift Live Hack. Love it, love it. Our, our speaker and, uh, and, and uh, uh, demo guy premier uh, is uh, Clinton Herget, who is the principal solutions engineer over at Sneak. Clinton, great to see you. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you very much, Charlene. Glad to be here. I'm going to add uh, overall demo guy to my resume for sure. That sounds you like absolutely a should because you're awesome at it. So <laughs> I'm going to put myself on mute, take myself off camera, and let you get to the awesomeness now. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks everybody for being with us here today. My name is Clinton. Uh, I am a principal solutions engineer at Sneak. Uh, if you're not familiar, Sneak stands for So Now You Know. We are a uh, developer first cloud native application security platform uh, that's designed to help developers uh, kind of detect security issues in their applications, you know, earlier in the development process before they get to production and really help, you know, identify the action they can take to remediate issues in the development phase before they become, you know, uh, production issues that are that are bringing down your, your site or your application. Uh, today's webinar is going to focus on Kubernetes security and specifically uh, security on Red Hat OpenShift. And how do you sneak to secure the workloads that you may have hosted on OpenShift, um, but then also how to remediate those issues once they're discovered, ideally integrating sneak uh, across your SDLC so that your developers have access to security tooling and to remediation advice uh, as early as possible. So the, the title of today's talk is Pod Problems. Uh, and I like that because, you know, ultimately everything in Kubernetes boils down to something going on on a pod. And if you're an operator or a DevOps engineer who's charged with maintaining those, you know, getting visibility into what happens in your pods is, uh, you know, absolutely uh, something that you need. But the visibility across the SDLC is really a major issue issue with a lot of security tools that focus on just the production infrastructure and not how do you build securely to begin with throughout that development cycle. So what we're going to be focusing on today, if I can just click to my agenda here, uh, first of all, oh no, I've been hacked. Uh, I'm going to introduce a potential exploit that affects certain kinds of uh, application workloads on Kubernetes, in this case on OpenShift. Uh, we're actually going to go over the exploit I'll be using, show how that affects one of my running containers, and ultimately it's going to result in a web page being defaced or, or uh, you know, successfully um, exploited by an attacker. Uh, because I have that workload in OpenShift, we're going to introduce the Sneak OpenShift controller and how to install that on my cluster uh, and actually use the Sneak OpenShift integration to detect those vulnerabilities in my workloads uh, in production at runtime. Um, we'll, we'll take a pause at that point and talk about, well, what do we really mean by Kubernetes application security, right? That's kind of a big term. It involves a lot of different layers of the application stack. And how should we really think of Kubernetes security as you know, maybe fundamentally different or an extension of the typical concepts we're used to thinking about in application security and, uh, and in cloud security? 
Once we've kind of got that under our belt, we'll look at how to use Sneak, uh, you know, how to help remediate those vulnerabilities that we discovered via that OpenShift integration uh, in our deployed Kubernetes applications. And that's where the, where the real power of Sneak comes in. It's not just about identifying vulnerabilities, it's how do you detect early and remediate, actually identify the action that a developer can take to make that workload more secure. Um, and so we'll look at that across uh, the SDLC, and then we'll look at preventive steps. How can we, now that we've successfully remediated the vulnerability that caused this exploit in our production workload, how can we ensure that doesn't happen again? How can we use the power of Sneak to, uh, from end to end, ensure that every time we've got a new workload added to my production cluster, that this isn't something that has to be repeated? Because, you know, let's face it, nobody likes being paged at 3 a.m. to say, hey, something's happened to your production site. You have to go in, triage the situation, figure out what went wrong, and ultimately apply the solution. Ideally, that's getting caught ahead of time when that application's being built to begin with. All right, so let's jump in. I decided to keep it really simple uh, today. So we're gonna make a really straightforward web application that's basically two things. I have an Nginx uh, pod that's running in my Kubernetes cluster. And I've got my ingress going over here through to Nginx. I didn't even bother putting together an HTML page. I've just got the default one uh, from, from Nginx here that you would uh, see if you just deployed a, a completely vanilla workload. Now. Sitting behind this Nginx pod, I have a PHP pod. And you know, PHP, everybody's favorite, maybe sometimes problematic web application framework. I can say that I'm an old school LAMP stack developer going way back in the day. I happen to know that the version of PHP that I'm using here uh, on, on this workload or sitting behind this uh, Nginx pod has a vulnerability. Um, that vulnerability is pretty well known. It's from a couple of years ago, and it actually has a package exploit that essentially anybody can download and use to attack, you know, any uh, endpoint, whether that's a, a server, a, a pod running on, on, you know, Kubernetes. Um, that happens to be running the, the vulnerable version of PHP. Um, I'll go ahead and show you actually the exploit that I'm using. This is in a public uh, GitHub repo. Uh, and I can put this in the, uh, the, the notes if you're interested in following up. The exploit that we're going to be looking at is CVE 2019-11043. And this is a critical severity remote code execution vulnerability in versions of, of PHP before uh, version, I believe, 7.3.11. So I have a PHP pod that's running Nginx, uh, as I mentioned, or, or at least Nginx is in front of it, with the PHP FPM uh, runtime, right, which is actually being used uh, to execute. And so there's a variety of ways that you could potentially configure your uh, connection between Nginx and PHP to enable this remote code execution. Um, so this repo actually contains everything you need to have a minimal test case, gives you the configuration, and also actually gives you the exploit to use. And if you were to run uh, this application, what it enables you to do is essentially say, you know, question mark A equals on the URL of my container, and then run any arbitrary command on that PHP pod. That's obviously really problematic, right? You, you certainly don't want to enable this remote code execution. So I'll actually just kind of simulate this. And I'm not going to show you the exact command I'm running here. I'll kind of leave that to, to you to figure out. But if I just run, you know, question mark A equals something, right? Looks like nothing happened. Um, but what actually I did here was I caused code to execute on that PHP pod that then uh, was able to jump over into the Nginx pod and overwrite this file that's being served when I go to the index page. So now if I actually reload and go to uh, this workload again, I get this defacement page, right? Like, oh no, I've been hacked. My site has been defaced. I'm sure whoever did it is very sorry, except they're probably not, right? So this is the point where I get paged and say, hey, we need to you know, do something right now, figure out how this vulnerability happened. How did it get into this pod, this, this uh, PHP workload that's running on OpenShift? And now what can we do about it? So leaving all the initial triage bits aside in terms of, you know, how do we, uh, how do we actually get this page off of our live website, lock down uh, the pod, et cetera. We're not going to be talking about those operational concerns. I'm more interested in what was the vulnerability that allowed this to happen? If I just wake up and see that my site has been defaced, uh, what kind of tools can I use to, you know, figure that out and then ultimately build in some safeguards so that doesn't happen again. 
Well, that's where Sneak comes in. So as I mentioned, Sneak is an end-to-end -end platform for cloud-native application security focused on the developer. Um, and I've just got a brand new Sneak organization here. Um, I understand that one of the ways Sneak can integrate uh, with my applications, and we'll go over a few of these later, is actually to plug in directly to my Kubernetes cluster. Sneak has got a number of integration points from uh, my source control manager, my container registry, uh, CI CD pipeline, IDE plugins even to enable your developer to detect these issues kind of as they're, they're uh, writing their code. And as I mentioned, our uh, Kubernetes uh, orchestrator integration. Now, OpenShift, of course, is a, a particular flavor of Kubernetes. And the way Sneak is going to support that is actually via an OpenShift operator that's available on Red Hat Operator Hub. Um, so if I actually look at how we are uh, configuring this, if I go in to configure my Kubernetes integration, uh, what I'll actually get is a, a settings page here with my integration ID that I'm then able to copy. This is kind of like the, the API key that I would use to integrate my workload with Sneak. We then get documentation by looking at the Kubernetes integration overview. If I go over here, uh, essentially, this page describes how do I install the Sneak controller to my OpenShift 4 uh, cluster using Operator Hub. It's actually really straightforward. I effectively, I, there's a couple of prerequisites I need to take care of. I need to use either kubectl or OC to create a namespace to run the monitor service. I then need to create a secret that gives uh, the, the Sneak application a couple of details about how I'm pulling my container images um, and uh, how I actually expect them to get uploaded to Sneak. So I need to pass two things here. I need to give it a... Um, uh, container uh, registry config file, so a JSON file that's the equivalent of like a Docker config that's got my um, my container registry credentials embedded in it, and then I need to give it that Sneak integration ID that I just pulled from the the last page here. It's really just a matter of those two things. So I'm going to go off to the command line now. I'm going to pop in you know this namespace, pop in the secret, and then the final thing I have to do is actually just um, install the controller from uh, Operator Hub. So I'm going to jump in here, and I've got my Redshift, or sorry, my OpenShift uh, running on uh, code-ready containers, which of course is the Red Hat, you know, local development platform. I don't know if you can hear my laptop now; it's running like a jet engine. Got lots of OpenShift goodness happening. I've already gone into Operator Hub, and I've said I want to install the Sneak operator. Um, and if I do that, I install this directly from Red Hat Marketplace. Um, we're essentially going to say, you know, here are the prerequisites, which we already talked about, create a namespace, create a secret. And then all I need to do is smash that install button. The Sneak uh, controller is going to spin up in my cluster. It's going to create a pod of its own. It's going to be scanning the workloads um, in my other namespaces, my other projects in OpenShift, and ultimately allowing Sneak to detect the vulnerabilities in those workloads, including the one we just uh, successfully exploited. Now, I know that was a lot really quickly, and we got right down into the weeds in terms of, hey, my site is broken. How do I go about fixing it? We've got this operator installed. But let's actually take a step back and, and talk about, well, what do we mean by securing a Kubernetes application, right? Like, what kinds of things am I even looking for here when it comes to, hey, what are the methods by which this could have been exploited? Um, and basically, whoops, one too many here. When you think about Kubernetes, you're really talking about modern applications, right? And that uh, entails a very different risk profile than applications maybe, you know, 10 years ago, even, even five years ago before kind of the, the Kubernetes and, and, and OpenShift revolution took place. Um, if we looked at this diagram, you know, back then, you would have seen a lot more reliance on the, the first party code, right? The proprietary code, the, the big monoliths that tended to run uh, you know, applications that were developed in-house, very little use of things like open source libraries, certainly before containerization um, and, and things like infrastructure as code. That's really shifted now where you see a lot relatively less reliance on that custom code and much more reliance on things like open source uh, dependencies, for example. In any given modern code base, we find that between 80 to 90 percent of the lines of code in that application are actually coming from open source dependencies. Um, so that means that that's where 80 to 90 percent of your potential vulnerabilities are coming from as well. 
containers just kind of extend that, right? Because now not only is that application shipped with its uh, app dependency tree in terms of, of open source libraries, you also have all these Linux packages that are deployed inside the container that that application needs to run. And so that's sort of the, uh, you know, the, the new unit of delivery for software, but it means that all the potential vulnerabilities in those packages, as we're about to see, are also shipped along with your application. So it's sort of the very thing that enables such rapid development with containers, but also makes them really insecure. And then the final layer is infrastructure as code. We're going to be talking a lot about this as well. Um, if you think about the way developers are now defining infrastructure, you've got things like YAML files that are living in the same repository with, say, a Docker file or with the application code and the, and the open source manifest. It's all kind of together uh, for an individual service. And what that means is that it's the same developers typically that are defining things like networking and storage and connectivity, cloud uh, resources that are being requisitioned. And of course, things like permissions around Kubernetes deployments that are often in those same YAML files. Um, what that fundamentally means is when we're looking at Kubernetes application security, um, we really mean a few different things, right? Because these responsibilities are shifting from the pre-cloud world where uh, security solutions were primarily operational or IT focused because you had a big central you know, IT stack that everything was deployed on, lots of use of individual VMs, uh, application code was the domain of the developers, but everything else kind of sat with this other group. And that's fundamentally shifted where most of these uh, uh, security aspects of an application are now actually in the developer's camp, right? Like they're in the same repo they're using day to day uh, to, to interact with their applications. That means that Kubernetes security is fundamentally a developer security problem. You need ways for developers to be able to detect and ultimately remediate those issues in their actual developer workflow. So fundamentally then what we mean, if we think back to that layer diagram of kind of the, the four pieces of a modern application, when we're talking about Kubernetes security, it's really two of those we wanna focus in on, right? It's the vulnerabilities that might be inside the container image. So if I'm, I'm shipping an application, I've compiled in or, or built all of my proprietary code, maybe that's in you know, some kind of a binary, um, maybe I've got uh, application open source dependencies, and then of course I've got the operating system packages, the runtimes, the utilities, all of that other stuff inside the container that helps that application run. All of those have potential vulnerabilities associated with them. But you then have to add the potential misconfiguration that's coming from your infrastructure as code. And this is really important because not only is it bad practice to have, uh, say, privilege escalation or to not be setting your resource limits on your Kubernetes deployments, for example, but those infrastructure as code misconfigurations can drastically affect or increase the blast radius of those potential vulnerabilities that exist inside your container. So really it's a, it's a one plus one equals a lot of risk situation here, right? You've got vulnerabilities inside the application itself, and then you've got the misconfigurations that could potentially lead to those being much worse in practice if they were to be exploited. So fundamentally, that's what the uh, Sneak OpenShift controller we just installed on our cluster is doing. First of all, it's going to scan the container images associated with each workload running in your cluster and identify those vulnerable packages or, or known vulnerabilities in the bill of materials associated with that container image, right? Um, we're going, the second thing we're going to do is we're going to prioritize those vulnerabilities we find based on the runtime configuration of how you've actually deployed your infrastructure as code into OpenShift. And again, the example will show, I think illustrate pretty clearly that a vulnerability in the container, while it's bad on its own, can be you know, affected quite, uh, you know, in, in quite a, a severe way by some common misconfigurations. And so we'll present or Sneak will show you those vulnerabilities prioritized by or taking into account that runtime configuration. We're going to say, hey, not only is this issue bad in its own, but because of the way you've configured your infrastructure as code, um, it's going to result in something potentially much worse. 
And then the third thing we're going to do is we'll mo uh, monitor for new vulnerabilities by rescanning those same workloads daily and alerting you if new vulnerabilities are found. So if there is a CVE that is brand new, has just been announced, and it affects a package in one of the workloads that Sneak is uh, monitoring, you'll get a notification based on that so you can immediately take action. So in my case, uh, ideally, before I saw this defacement page, I would have gotten a notification from Sneak saying, hey, this is probably something you should take a look at because we've detected a pretty severe vulnerability in this container that's affected by the way you're actually deploying this out into OpenShift. All right. All of that said, I think we've allowed time for our sneak controller uh, and OpenShift to actually go ahead and get spun up. Let's see how this looks in practice once I actually jump back here into the sneak platform. All right, so back here on my integrations page, where again, I've got a number of options for how to proceed. I've got my Kubernetes configured um, because I installed the controller. Let's go ahead and jump in. So I've got a page here that's saying, what workloads do you want to test uh, with Sneak? And because I've got this project here that contains the hacked version of my page, uh, the, the borked version, in other words, I'm going to onboard both of these deployments. I've got my Nginx pod or, or deployment that then spins up a pod and my PHP deployment that then uh, spins up pods of its own. So let's go ahead and add those. And this is going to happen very quickly. So where Sneak is going out, is actually going to pull in um, those container images, perform the scan, and give me this report of all the vulnerabilities um, that, are, that are found to exist. And so I can see a couple of things kind of right off the bat. If I'm just looking at a summary here, and I think maybe if I stretch this window a little bit, this will pop in a little bit better. Here we go. Um, I've got a number of vulnerabilities in this PHP pod. I have comparatively fewer actually in my uh, in my Nginx pod. If I look at here, I can see I've actually got zero vulnerabilities in that Nginx container itself. Um, so this probably isn't where the exploit actually happened, right? Like even though this defacement happened on the Nginx pod, I don't actually see anything vulnerable in here. And if I actually look at the deployment uh, itself, because remember, Sneak is looking at not just the vulnerabilities on the container, but also misconfigurations and how they're being deployed, um, I'm seeing all of these look green, right? I, I'm setting my, uh, my, my privileges correctly. I'm not running as a, a root user. I've got CPU and RAM limits on, on this uh, deployment set pretty well. So that means I have to look elsewhere, right? Which might be a little bit counterintuitive. Obviously, I, I my first instinct was to say, well, it's obviously something with the pod that got defaced. That's the issue, right? But if I investigate a little bit further, I see something really interesting. I'm now looking at my PHP deployment, and I see two things that jump out at me right off the bat, just within a few seconds of having scanned this in Sneak. The first thing is I have the highest uh, uh, um, remediation priority that Sneak is identifying. In other words, this is the uh, vulnerability I should really be looking at first according to our uh, prioritization algorithm here. Um, wouldn't you know it, this is pointing at CVE 2019-11043, which was the vulnerability that we just exploited. Um, if I look a little bit further in, I can actually go into Sneak's vulnerability database. This is where we collect all of our uh, kind of research about every vulnerability that we're tracking across Linux, across multiple uh, open source uh, package managers and frameworks. And if I look at the record on this, we see it's an out of bounds write vulnerability affecting PHP 7.3 versions before the .11 variant when it was fixed. And of course I say, hey, this has the possibility of remote code execution, which we just saw because I was able to uh, create the, uh, the exploit um, by, by using that code that I just downloaded from GitHub. So I know this is pretty bad, right? It's a CVSS 9.8 critical severity issue. But Sneak is also telling me two additional things which make this even more of a concern. First of all, we're seeing that it has a mature exploit available. That means Sneak knows there is published code that can attack this vulnerability. We're going to take that into account when we prioritize these issues. Of course, I know there's a mature exploit because that's what I used to hack it. But um, if I wasn't aware of you know, which vulnerabilities have exploits associated with them that are actually causing and leading to attacks in the real world, um, I'm going to want to know that, right? I probably want to remediate the issues that have known exploits um, before I move on to the rest associated with my application. 
So we'll take that into account uh, when computing this priority score. Mature exploit, you know, definitely kind of the worst there is, because as we saw, all I needed to do is run, you know, git clone on a repo and uh, follow the readme, right? And then I successfully hacked this pop. Um, the other things that Sneak is taking into account when we're computing this priority score are the fact that I've misconfigured this workload, right? So you can see essentially every one of the uh, potential misconfigurations in this, uh, you know, this workload at, at runtime uh, is reflected here, meaning we know this vulnerability could potentially be exacerbated by a number of these other uh, you know, uh, infrastructure vulnerabilities. I'm not setting my memory and CPU limits. Um, I have excess capabilities on the deployment. Most importantly, I'm running as a privileged container. So if we look here at uh, the really top one on the list, I see that um, are any containers in this workload uh, have container.securitycontext.privileged in the YAML file? And in this case, yes. Uh, so I'm failing this condition. We're going to prioritize any potential remote code execution vulnerabilities much higher as the result of this privileged condition. Why is that? Because if I'm running as a privileged pod, then by definition, I have access to resources on the host or the node that I'm running on, including the ability to potentially go into other pods on the node and you know, mess around with the contents. And that's exactly what's happened here. So that exploit that I didn't show you uh, attached to that A you know, uh, value in the query string, what it actually did was uh, jumped over from the PHP pod into that Nginx pod and defaced the home page, right? It inserted our, uh, our hacked page into the Nginx pod, even though that wasn't the pod with the vulnerability. It was actually back here in PHP. Okay. So I think I've successfully triaged the issue, right? I know how the hack happened. I can see those results in Sneak. Um, and you know, we'll continue monitoring this workload moving forward. But what I really want to know is, what can I actually do about that, right? Um, you know, typically, if I'm just looking at a runtime or a production operational security solution, uh, I don't know what to communicate back to maybe the developer who, uh, who created this, right? I'm sort of stuck in terms of, well, what can I really do to remediate to ensure we're not going to fall victim to this again? Well, um, as I mentioned, Sneak is a solution not just for Kubernetes security, but we actually want to provide cross SDLC coverage uh, for the DevSecOps world. And what that really means is all the way from the coding phase where developers are actually writing their applications, they're choosing their uh, open source dependencies, they're building their container images through the check-in phase in source control, through the CI CD phase, um, through the container registry, and ultimately out uh, into production. So you can see we basically started here. We had our OpenShift project scanned with Sneak and got all of those results. But it can't really be fixed here, right? It actually needs to be fixed back here in the coding phase. So this is why Sneak has a number of IDE integrations, for example, source control integrations, CI CD plugins, container registry scanning capabilities in order to allow development teams to very flexibly integrate their security solutions. So I can not only scan my production workloads uh, in you know, OpenShift once I've already deployed them, but I can also scan them way earlier in the development process, ideally way back here in either my IDE or in my source control phase, so I can identify those issues before they've reached production. Let's take a look at how that works. So I'll jump back over here to Sneak. I'm going to add a new project. Uh, so this is the same application, but I'm actually going to reference uh, the GitHub repo where I've actually stored this code that created both those containers um, that, that had the vulnerability, as well as the infrastructure as code file that uh, contained the misconfiguration. Again, very fast scan. Sneak found eight projects in that repo. And if I open this up, I've got um, uh, I've, well, actually, I need to uh, ensure that I'm seeing everything that's active here, but I have got my um, deployment file, right, where I used to deploy that PHP workload. Um, and we've also got a Docker file in here that shows me the vulnerabilities in the, uh, the container that I onboarded, right, in that PHP container. So let's, let's actually look at this deployment file first. 
Thinking back to the previous slide where we're looking at those four layers of the modern application, right? This is actually dealing with the infrastructure as code layer. So uh, one of the four products in the Sneak platform called Sneak IAC or infrastructure as code is designed to scan these YAML files um, when they're actually in the, the code phase. So when they're at rest and be able to identify a lot of the same issues that we saw later at runtime that affected the blast radius of the vulnerability in our container. So for example, uh, I can see that my container is running in privileged mode, right? And we you know, describe what the issue is. You can understand the impact of it, which is that that compromised container could be used to modify the you know, underlying host, right? Which is exactly what we saw. I was able to jump into another pod to make a change. But then most crucially, I actually get the remediation advice. So now I know that what I need to do is change the security context uh, dot privileged attribute um, and set the value to false, right? I either need to remove that from the YAML file because I can see exactly right here, this is what's causing the issue. And Sneak is telling me, here's the step forward. Here's what I need to know as a developer to ensure that this is not going to happen again. The other uh, piece uh, that I will actually need to fix is, of course, the uh, container that I use. And now we see this is updated. Um, so I've got the Docker file also in this repo that I used to build the PHP container that uh, ultimately contained that exploit. So this is another of uh, Sneak's products called Sneak Container, which is actually focused on scanning vulnerabilities inside container images. We can also look at base images that are referenced uh, just by reading the Docker file as it sits in something like a, a GitHub repo, for example. So not only do I have a list of all of the vulnerabilities associated with this container image, and again, we'll prioritize based on what has a known exploit, uh, based on what is trending on social media. So you've got all of this information to help you decide kind of what to prioritize for remediation. But because most uh, vulnerabilities in container images actually come from the base image rather than something that I'm installing on top of it, uh, a really neat feature of Sneak Container is I can actually look at what vulnerabilities have come in from the base image of the container that I'm using, right, which was this PHP 7.3.9, and I've got 11 critical severity issues. 230 total, right? But I can also see a number of options for how could I potentially upgrade the base container image to, uh, you know, start with a more secure, you know, uh, uh, parent, right? I can, I can start on a more known footing so I can ensure that I'm staying up to date and I'm not actually going to be vulnerable to these exploitable conditions moving forward. Um, so, for example, I see that if I went to, uh, you know, uh, PHP 7.3.29, I can go down to three critical issues from 11, which is a great improvement. But maybe I want to play around with another upgrade. Um, so we'll give you some alternatives here. If I went all the way to PHP 8, you know, then I could knock out another critical issue, go down to 68 total vulnerabilities. And this is really powerful if you think of it from the developer's perspective, right? I can actually be looking at this information from the context of, my local environment, having just built this container, scanned it directly on my CLI and get this information right back. So then before I've even pushed this Docker file into my GitHub repo, before I've kicked off any kind of CI process, I can know I'm starting with the most secure uh, uh, potential option here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and maybe update to one of these, uh, you know, PHP 8 images uh, just for grins here. I can go ahead and open this fix pull request directly from Sneak. So we will go ahead and make the change. Um, and uh, effectively, that's it. I've upgraded my Docker file. I'm going to go ahead and uh, also make that change to my, uh, my YAML file, my infrastructure as code. Um, you can see the change being made here. This is all completely automated. I'm moving from the vulnerable image to the no longer vulnerable one. Um, and I'm going to push that through. Let's just call it an imaginary CI CD uh, pipeline. So I might be running a little bit low on time here. Um, that's going to rebuild these images. It's going to rerun the OC apply or kubectl apply commands to actually push that remediated workload back into my OpenShift cluster. Well, let's verify that actually worked, right? I know it's like a lot to say, hey, we've remediated everything just by making one click and making one change to a YAML file, but uh, let's see that the, uh, the proof is in the pudding here. So if I go back to my integrations, 
I'm going to now onboard the remediated workload from my OpenShift cluster. And I'm going to, uh, you know, actually uh, install it from a new namespace here, right? So I, in, in that imaginary CI pipeline, I just applied it to this fixed namespace. And if I go ahead and add, ideally what we're going to see here, if the live demo gods are in agreement with me today, is um, that we now have uh, two new projects, right? I've got my new Nginx workload that's actually coming from the fixed namespace. This looks exactly the same because I'm no longer seeing any issues here. But in addition, I'm seeing the, uh, the PHP workload, right? That no longer has um, any of the failures in terms of the infrastructure misconfigurations, right? Because I've updated my YAML to set the resource limits. I no longer, most importantly, I'm running it as a privileged container. Um, and, you know, I, I have niceties like I'm not running as a non-root user. I have, uh, you know, read-only access to the root file system. Um, and, you know, I've got a smattering of vulnerabilities here still on the image that I should probably look at. But critically, I don't have any with a known exploit, right? I no longer have that critical CVE that has that prepackaged exploit that could then not only exploit my single container, but then be used to take advantage of this privilege escalation to jump to another container on the pod as well. So I'd love to say that my work is done here and just wrap this up and move forward. But uh, again, I don't want to be woken up next time this happens, right? So what can I do to ensure that we're automating this process as much as possible? I already know I can integrate Sneak with my GitHub uh, uh, repo so that we can be scanning you know, code as it's being merged in, blocking anything from being merged that doesn't correspond with my security policy. That's already great protection. But I still want to know, like, if there's a workload with a vulnerability that's pushed into my OpenShift cluster, I want to get that notification, right? I don't want to find out when, you know, it's, it's actually been exploited. So Sneak has a few options for how to deal with that. Um, and uh, we had started out, and as you saw earlier, you can manually onboard uh, workloads. Um, and a workload, by the way, I think I had this on a slide earlier, not just a deployment, but it's anything that defines a container image that could be a job, a replica set, uh, a daemon set, anything like that. Um, so you can definitely do it manually via the UI. You can also make an API call. So we have an import projects endpoint. And if I just said import a project, maybe as part of a CI pipeline, then that would automatically get onboarded anytime that pipeline gets run without me having to go to the UI. So that's definitely good for automation. Still requires a little bit of upfront work to, to get going, um, but you know, is, uh, is, is a good option for, uh, for a number of people. The third way you can add a automatically onboard Kubernetes or OpenShift workloads to Sneak is by adding an annotation uh, to any of those workload YAML files. So if I just simply said, you know, in my annotation section, orgs.kates.sneak.io slash v1, that would ensure that when uh, I, I uh, cube cuddle apply uh, that deployment, it'll actually automatically get picked up by Sneak and I'll automatically have that product or that uh, project rather in my Sneak UI ready to be scanned with that proactive monitoring so that tomorrow and every day, if there's a new vulnerability, I'll get that notification. Um, we've also recently added two new ways to uh, auto excuse me, automatically on, uh, onboard workloads. Uh, the first is that in addition to annotating an individual uh, workload or, or deployment, you can actually now annotate an entire namespace. So if I simply said when I created my, uh, you know, my Red Hat webinar namespace that I added uh, this, uh, this annotation, then anything I deployed in that namespace that created a, uh, or that referenced a container image would create a project in Sneak. So that's a really good blanket way to say, Anything that is in these namespaces I'm monitoring, regardless of whether my developers have added that annotation to the deployment, I want to make sure that that ends up with a sneak project. And then the final way uh, that we have is actually to create a custom policy using a Rego file. And the way you do this um, is basically to create a config map. Um, and we have uh, the documentation available on this as well. Um, if I wanted to um, automatically onboard these workloads, I would essentially create a config map that contains the, uh, the Rego rules that, uh, that I want to use. And that could be anything from looking at a specific set of, uh, 
of labels. Um, it could potentially be looking at, um, you know, a uh, any other annotation on the workload. Um, I might only want to, you know, onboard certain kinds, like maybe only work only deployments, but not jobs. So I just created config map with those rules in Rego. When I apply or when I create the uh, OpenShift controller or the sneak controller in OpenShift, I would apply um, that uh, uh, that config map to it. And then essentially we're going to apply those rules to any of my new workloads and ensure that based on your internal business logic, we're monitoring the right things in sneak. All right, so I think that's pretty much it. A uh, quick recap of what we talked about today. Um, we deployed the uh, the Sneak uh, controller to OpenShift. Uh, we actually did that via the uh, operator hub, not via Helm. Um, and we then triaged the exploit uh, in our hacked container using the Sneak priority score with the runtime context, right? Because remember, Kubernetes application security, it's all about the one plus one equals bad news. It's the vulnerability inside the container plus the misconfiguration of the infrastructure as code equals the blast radius, right? Because if I had set my IAC privileges correctly, although that attacker could have potentially exploited a single container, he wouldn't have then been able to deface my other pod uh, as a result. Um, after that, we looked at how to remediate, right? So we used the GitHub integration from Sneak to find the easy remediation advice for both Sneak container by doing that automated fixed PR against my Docker file and my infrastructure as code issues by getting that fixed advice directly in line as that uh, uh, issue is being reported. Lots of other useful ways to integrate Sneak with uh, your source control manager, including uh, things like PR checks. You can even automate those fixed PRs. And again, of course, um, that's not the end of the integrations. We can go anywhere from the IDE through the CI pipeline, container registry, uh, run, you know, runtime, obviously, and more. And then the last thing we talked about was ways to ensure that my future workloads on that OpenShift cluster get automatically monitored uh, by Sneak from now on so that I don't have to get woken up uh, in the middle of the night uh, when there's a potential issue. So what's next? Uh, how can you take action if you saw something you liked today? Um, definitely go to sneak.io and uh, sign up for a free Sneak account uh, if you're interested in playing around. You can also find Sneak on the Red Hat Marketplace. Uh, and as I mentioned, the Sneak controller for OpenShift available in Operator Hub as well. Um, and please talk to us about setting up an evaluation. The runtime monitoring for Kubernetes does require a Sneak Enterprise license. But we also have a freemium uh, version where you can do the GitHub integration and a number of other uh, uh, integrations across that SDLC as well for individual developers and for smaller teams. Here are the uh, links to the documentation uh, pieces that I showed today. But you can also just find those by going to support.sneak.io, going to Sneak Container, and then to Kubernetes. I think that's all I've got. Thank you, everybody, for uh, making the time today. Of course, thank you to our friends at Red Hat uh, for uh, making this time available to us. And uh, Charlene, I think I'll just throw it back over to you to see if there's any questions in the chat. Awesome. We have gotten a lot of questions in, but there's still time. If you guys have a question for Clinton, please go ahead and use that question and answer uh, tab. Get it on in there. You can also put it in the chat tab. We'll move it over for you. Let's go ahead and dive into the questions that we have. First one, from Michael, is the sneak operator a Helm chart or a Golang? Yeah, great question. Um, so it is primarily packaged as a, uh, a Helm chart, and it's a, it, the code is actually open source. Um, uh, we can we can post that link so you can go out and take a look. Um, it does work on, on all Kubernetes clusters uh, by installing it via the Helm chart. Uh, but of course, via OpenShift, uh, we have the special integration via Operator Hub. So it's just a one-click install for your OpenShift clusters. All right. Great. Uh, next question here from uh, Basanta, who asks, uh, how is uh, Sneak Kubernetes security different from other vendors like Veeam? Yeah, I, I won't say anything bad about Veeam. We got a lot of uh, uh, coworkers, including our CEO, who came from Veeam. But uh, Sneak, I would say, is really about three things. Um, first of all, it's a developer-focused uh, security solution. And we really pride ourselves on developer-facing integrations. What that really means is lowering the barrier to entry as much as possible so that developers can't have a downhill process for security. Maybe that means integrating into the IDE. Maybe it's the local command line. Uh, you know, Maybe it's the Git environment. But 
actually, you know, making that as, as easy as possible so that it's easier to use the security tool than not. Because, you know, what, what typically happens is security buys a tool, it creates friction in developer workflows, they don't use it, it gets ignored, and then just becomes shelfware. So Sneak was really created to, to solve that problem first and foremost. How can we recruit the developer community to become security champions? And really that means minimizing friction, right? Developers hate rework more than anything. They hate yeah. their their uh, you know uh, their deployments getting slowed down. They hate things getting blocked for reasons they don't understand. So that's the first and foremost differentiator from Sneak. Second, I would say is it's not enough to just shift left. You, you can't just take a uh, operational security solution and kind of force it into the developer workflow. What a developer really needs to see from security intelligence um, is is different. What they want is identification of the action they can take to make it better, to actually enact the remediation. And maybe that's, as we saw, a uh, showing the change that needs to be made to the YAML file. Maybe it's an automated upgrade of the container image. Um, maybe it's making a suggestion about what they can do for a static code finding. Um, so we always want to be creating, uh, uh, you know, reports and everything that we're pushing to the developer in terms of the action or the fix rather than in terms of the problem. The third thing I would say is uh, we really pride ourselves on having the best sources of vulnerability intelligence in the industry. We have our Sneak Intel vulnerability database, which I showed a little bit earlier, um, that is a hand curated database of thousands of vulnerabilities. We're able to eliminate a lot of the noise, a lot of the uh, false positives you would find in a lot of other solutions. Um, and we are able to augment that with things like the exploit maturity analysis the social media chatter analysis um, to give you a really three-dimensional view of what is the risk level of this particular vulnerability in this specific context of an individual application. And then on top of that, we have our deep code AI engine, which powers our static analysis solution and is able to provide insights across the platform. So combining that power of machine learning with actual hand curated vulnerability data uh, really gets at, you know, uh, the, a list of what are the most prioritized vulnerabilities that you need to focus your time and energy on today. Okay. God, so many great questions. Uh, there's still time, though, guys, if you have a question, please go ahead and get it on in. Paul asks, uh, does the OpenShift controller scan for ransomware vulnerabilities? Uh, a great question, yeah. Um, what I would say here is there's there's a lot of different ways potentially ransomware could end up on a container. Um, what Sneak will be looking at is, you know, first of all, what are the Linux packages that have been installed? Are any of those known to be malicious? And then we can also look at what are the uh, application package manifests on the container? So if I've got like a, a jar file that has no open source dependencies inside, or I have a, uh, a package, you know, JSON or a package lock file that has my JavaScript dependency tree. Sneak can detect those and then give you that, that full um, transitive dependency report. So you'll know every bit of open source that's coming in. If those are known to be malicious packages, then we'll absolutely flag those and you'll, you'll get the notification because that's obviously the worst kind of, of vulnerability. Um, but I, I would point out that Sneak is still very much a developer focused or a, a build time container tool. Where we're going is being able to integrate a lot more runtime features, which, which we saw some of today. But uh, we're looking at ways to do things like see actually what is the drift between what's on that container in the running pod and what was on the image that it got pulled from, right? Because typically if you've got a Bitcoin miner, you probably didn't put it there yourself, right? Or if you did, hopefully Sneak would have found it earlier. But if it's been exploited and there's something on that container that shouldn't be, how can we bring that back to the developer so they can then enact that remediation? So we've got a lot of exciting things coming on that front. Awesome. Awesome. Looking forward to that. Okay. Uh, another question here from KT. Um, I, I hope I'm asking this correctly. Um, do the I infrastructure's code um, scans support Terraform? Yes, absolutely. To, as of today, Sneak Infrastructure's code supports the Kubernetes configs, as we saw, uh, as well as Helm charts, uh, Terraform, and we can scan both the TF files and the plan files, and AWS CloudFormation as well. Um, we're looking to constantly be adding more support for additional uh, CSP uh, languages for IAC and always adding more rules to the, uh, uh, to the IAC engine. Okay. All right. Uh, Michael asked if you're going to sneak is going to be at KubeCon. Oh, absolutely. Excellent. 
Excellent. In person, live and in person, huh? <laughs> as in person as we can be here. <laughs> all right. All right. Great. Next question from Paul. Uh, how do I get sync scanning into my developers? Or sorry, is it sync? I think, it, does he mean sync or sneak at this point? Scanning. Correct. That happens all the yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> in, um, into my developer's environment. Yeah. <laughs> sneak. Yeah. <laughs> A absolutely. Um, I, I would say, you know, definitely the first place to start would be go to sneak.io, get an account. I mean, it truly takes like two clicks and maybe five seconds to onboard a repo from GitHub and get started. Um, out of the box, you'll have things like PR checks on your code. You'll have recurring monitoring. You'll get notifications for new vulnerabilities. You can also very easily grab one of our IDE plugins, whether that's something like Eclipse or IntelliJ or, or VS Code, uh, plug it directly into the developer experience. Um, a really robust command line tool as well. We didn't talk about that much today, but if I wanted to integrate Sneak into maybe a CI pipeline or just bring it to my developer desktop and say, Sneak test my open source dependencies, my container, my, uh, you know, my actual first party code, my IAC files, I can do all of that with the Sneak CLI. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. All right, guys, we have about uh, 10 minutes or 11 minutes until the uh, the end of the webinar. We do have a couple minutes left for question and answer. So please, if, you do, if you've got a question, now's the time to go ahead and get it on in. We do have one more question here from Michael who asks, with applications moving to multi-cloud, how many different security software apps will we need to protect our workloads? Are there additional software companies that complete the security layer along with Sneak? Uh, that, that is a great question. And yeah, we have a number of strategic partnerships with uh, other security vendors, obviously, uh, you know, uh, kind of platform companies like Red Hat. Um, what I would say is we, a Sneak is aiming to be a one-stop shop for developer-focused security. So if it's something that can be, you know, uh, either introduced or remediated by a developer as part of their workflow, that's mm -hmm. absolutely where Sneak wants to be. There are other aspects to security, things like dynamic scanning, for example, right? And, and we're not going to say that you should replace all of those more traditional solutions with something like Sneak. But as we continue to see the shift from the operational uh, side of the house into more and more and more developers, both in terms of headcount and responsibility. Um, Sneak's mission is to really meet them, you know, already there. And that's why we start with things like IAC file scanning rather than production infrastructure scanning, right? Because our, our goal here is to say, like, if you've got an issue, say, in your AWS or in your, uh, you know, uh, in your actual cloud deployed environment, then it's already really too late. That should have been caught earlier, maybe in GitHub by doing an IAC scan on the YAML file, for example. Um, so, yeah, we'd be more than happy to talk to you about all of our strategic partnerships. Um, but, you know, I think the way to think about the evolution of security is you really need to recruit developers and integrate into their workforce because otherwise the problem, it, it, the, the fix doesn't scale to meet the size of the problem, right? Uh, there's, there's way more developers than there will ever be security professionals. It's time to empower them. And that means meeting them where they're at. It means focusing on the, the fix rather than the problem. And it means ensuring that you've got security data that you trust. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that is all the questions that have come in. I'm going to leave the question and answer tab open uh, to see if we get any other last minute questions in. While we are waiting, uh, just a quick reminder to the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the presentation, or if you just want to watch it again, you'll have the opportunity to do so. We will be sending out an email after today's webinar that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. The webinar is also going to be living on the Security Boulevard website, so you can always go look for it there. Just go to securityboulevard.com slash webinars and look in the on demand section and it should be right there waiting for you. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions come in. Um, hold on, we just got something in chat. Yes, I got a question. Is Sneak able to trigger action on a pipeline when a breach is found and then block deployment? That's from Gabor. Yeah, great question. Um, I, I would say there's lots of ways to take action within a pipeline if vulnerabilities are found. Uh, you have the ability to apply, say, custom security policies, 
which again, we didn't really get into today, but I could actually do something like say, treat any known exploit as a critical vulnerability and have that block my build, you know, in which case, if I was trying to push that container image that had that PHP vulnerability and I was running sneak in my pipeline, it would have blocked it at that point. Um, and we plug in directly with Jenkins, Circle CI, Team City, a number of other uh, CICD pipelines, or you can just take that sneak CLI, plug it in directly as a shell task, and you've got all those options available to really craft that right balance, you know, between velocity and security when it comes to your pipelines. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Um, yeah. So once again, uh, I'll leave this open in case we uh, do get a last minute question in. Uh, but uh, let's, while we're waiting, let's go ahead and do the drawing for the $425 Amazon gift cards. Okay, let's see. Our first winner today is Joel H. Congratulations, Joel. Our second winner today is Sasha S. S. Congratulations, Sasha. Easy for me to say. Our third winner today is uh, John R. Congratulations, John. And our fourth winner today is Vasanta T. Congratulations, Vasanta. We'll be following up with all of you, all four of you via uh, email to get your gift card over to you. And uh, if you don't see it there in your inbox, please check your uh, spam folder. I think that's it for the question. Um, Chris, Chris said, awesome talk. Thanks for the talk and cool about the on demand. So awesome. And then Patrick said, congrats all. So lots of good stuff from the, uh, from the audience. Thanks for everybody for, um, for engaging in today's webinar. Good, good stuff all the way around. Love the questions. I love the commentary throughout. So, um, uh, that, that's, that's always a pleasure to, uh, to moderate. So, but Clinton, thank you for your expertise and for showing us, uh, all about the, the sneak technology. It is some nifty, nifty stuff. And uh, what you guys are doing is great stuff. So thanks very much for bringing your expertise and, uh, and, and your time to today's webinar. Really do appreciate it. Thank you, Charlene. And thanks, everyone, for making the time. Yes, yes. Also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody. And please, whatever you do, stay safe. <laughs>